Well, my name is Ann Dixon, and I'm a writer and a librarian. And behind me are some of the books that I have written. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about writing books and how books get made. And we'll have a couple stories, too. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, first, let's talk about just a little bit about when you write a book, what do you think you need first of all to get started? Paper. Paper? paper. Yeah, paper helps. What else? There's something you need even before you have paper. Ideas. Ideas. There you go. Oh, yeah, you gotta have an idea. Otherwise. Pencils and ink. Pencils and paper, that's, that helps, yeah. That's, but yeah, first of all, you got to have an idea. And sometimes people ask writers, where do you get your ideas for your stories? That's one of the things people ask all the time. So I'm going to start by reading one of my stories, and then we'll talk about where the idea came from that, for that story, okay? And it's going to take me a little bit of technology here. Let's see if I get this right. Anything happen? Not yet. There we go. Can you see the blueberry shoe? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is the blueberry shoe. It's um, a book I wrote oh a number of years ago. It's still one of my favorites and it must be other people like it too because it's still in print. So I think I'll read that first, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about how the story came to be. Okay? Once there was a family who loved to pick blueberries. Every summer they picked their way up Tarmigan Mountain and then scrambled, laughing and munching back down. But one summer, somewhere between the top of Ptarmigan Mountain and the bottom, Baby lost his shoe. See the shoe falling off there? There it goes. Lost your shoe, exclaimed Mama. Now what will we do? There was only one thing to do. Back up the mountain they crept searching mossy hummocks for one tiny shoe. Back down the mountain they crept and pretended until at last shadows grew so long they saw shoes everywhere and nowhere at all. Everyone was tired except Baby who played with his toes all the way home and hollered bye bye shoe. That night, as the family slept, dreaming of blueberries and shoes, a weary little bowl up Ptarmigan Mountain bumped her nose on Baby's shoe. What's this, she chirped, sniffing about. A little nest for me? She tugged at the shoelace. She snipped and gnawed tiny pieces to tuck inside the shoe. And then she climbed into her cozy new nest and slept. There she is. A little vole woke up hungry. She left her nest and scurried through the brush, nibbling at flowers. But somewhere between the brush and the flowers, little vole lost her nest. Lost my nest, she squeaked. Now what will I do? There was only one thing to do. She dug a burrow in the soft, damp earth and rested. By now, Baby's shoe was halfway to Fox's den. It smells strongly of vole, thought Mother Fox. It's a plaything for my kits. She trotted toward home, but stopped at the top of the hill. With a nip of her teeth, she bit through the sole. A shake of her head tossed the plaything sky high. It landed 
and up fluttered a ptarmigan from her hiding place. With a leap, Fox gave chase, but a moment too late, ptarmigan flapped furiously towards safe trees below. Fox gave up and turned back for her plaything. But somewhere between the top of the hill and the trees below, Mother Fox lost her plaything. Lost my plaything, she lamented. Now what will I do? There was only one thing to do. She returned to the den, empty mouth. Children, I'm home, she barked. And the kids skipped as they yipped, Hooray, Mama's home. Meanwhile, Baby Shoe was being seriously sniffed by a big brown bear. Curious, mumbled the bear. This tiny morsel smells of fox and vole. Is there nothing delicious inside? I'll save it for later. And bear flung the morsel into a blueberry patch and began digging after squirrels. Popples of dirt flew through the air, showering bushes and berries and one tiny shoe. At last, with no luck, Bear became tired and remembered his curious morsel. But somewhere between the blueberry patch and the squirrel holes, Bear lost his tiny morsel. Lost my morsel, he grumbled. Now what will I do? There was only one thing to do. He munched blueberries by the snout hole all the way home. As summer turned to fall, blueberries withered and fell. Snow soon covered the blueberry seeds that dropped into baby's shoe. Bear slept through the darkness as winter snows piled deep. Fox hunted, bowl nibbled, and the family who loved to pick blueberries ate blueberries all winter long. Finally, Summer returned, and those blueberries came alive. They grew and greened and ripened. One day, the family returned too. They picked their way up Tarmigan Mountain, even baby, for he was barely a baby anymore. And they scrambled laughing and munching all around. Look at this, exclaimed sister on hands and knees. The family gathered about. It's my blueberry shoe, said Baby. But who planted the blueberry, wondered Sister. Who filled the shoe with dirt, wondered Dad. Who poked holes for the roots and the rain, wondered Mama. Baby wondered, who took my shoelace? When back down the mountain the family crept, very stained, smiling, and tired, each carried a bucket brim full of berries, except Baby, who carried a bucket full of shoes. Baby planted his shoe in the garden with a new shoelace tied in a bow, and next year he was the first to pick a single ripe berry, a very sweet ripe berry from that beautiful blueberry shoe. And that is the story of the blueberry shoe. On the back here you see a picture of me a long time ago picking blueberries and a picture of the illustrator, the person who drew the pictures. And her name is Yvonne Jurvitz and she lives in Ketchikan, which is not too far from Juneau. So Blueberry Shoe, that was my first book. But how did I get the idea for that? Well, I'll tell you, it was something that really happened. I'll switch back here while I talk to you. There, huh? there we go. Uh, raise your hand if you ever go berry picking. Anybody here ever go berry picking? Yeah, lots of us pick berries in Alaska. 
And my family always picked berries too. And one summer when we went berry picking, one of my baby lost her shoe, just like in the story. And we looked for the shoe and we didn't find it. Well, that's what gave me the beginning idea for this story. I went home and I thought about that and I thought about what would happen to a shoe that was up on the mountain all by itself. And then I thought, well, probably some animals would find it. And what would they think a shoe was? And what would they do with the shoe? So that's the part where I started imagining. And so then I wrote the story, started to write a story down. Now when a, when a story first gets started, I'll tell you, it's usually pretty messy. I'm going to show you a, the first version of The Sleeping Lady. This is one of the earliest versions. First I wrote in pencil and then I typed it. But see all these places where I cross things out and I scribble things in and every page looks like that. Pretty messy. So I do many, many copies like that until I finally get the story to be the way I want it. And then it looks more like this. This, was a, this is kind of an old version because this was actually done on a typewriter, I think, not a computer. And so that's the way I send it off to a person called an editor. And that's, those are people who um, make books and they decide whether or not they want to publish my book. But actually before I send it off, um, one of the early things I do once I know what the story is, is I make what's called a dummy. Now a dummy is not something that you mean that you say to another person. A dummy in the book world is <laughs> something like this, only mine's not very good. Um, it's, a, it's just because a picture book doesn't have very many pages. Have you noticed that? Yeah, how many pages do you think a picture book has? Anybody know? Anybody out there know how many pages? Take a guess. 110? No. Five? No, more than that. Okay, there's usually 32 pages in a picture book. So there's a lot of pages, and you have to make, right, 32. So you have to make sure that your story is going to fit into your, into 32 pages. Now when I draw a dummy, I'm just trying to make sure that my story will fit. But when an artist draws a dummy, it looks a lot better. The artist is doing the same thing, trying to see how the story is going to fit. But that's what the artist drew. That looks a lot better than what I drew, don't you think? Quite a bit better. That's why I'm a writer and not the illustrator. But that was her dummy. She started out, she still made lots of changes, but this was just sort of the first rough draft. So those are a couple of uh, dummies, and every illustrator works a little bit differently. Here's a dummy. Um, it's not even really a dummy. It's more like thumbnail sketches for the blueberry shoe. Can you kind of see? There's the mountain, and the people, and the berries all around. Now the illustrator did this, not me. But her scribbles are are better than my scribbles, I would have to say. See, back down the mountain they crept. And here they are, there's the baby in the backpack. Hi, where's my shoe? <laughs> the mouse, the bull climbing in the shoe. So that was her dummy, Yvonne's dummy. After a, a let's see, here's one for Big Enough Anna, which is another one of my books. Let's see how that one looks. This is a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty far along dummy. These are some very nice sketches. 
a little beyond the initial dummy stage. I can show you the book. We can compare. Here's the book, Big Enough Anna. I'll see if I can find that page to show you. Here it is. So there's the first sketch, and here's how it looked afterward. Maybe we can get them both on the same, almost. Similar, but not exactly the same. So artists change their, their minds all the time, too, while they're working, just like uh, writers do. So let's look next. Come back on here. Let's look at another one called When Posey Peaked. And that would be... This book here. When Posey, what's the first thing you noticed? When Posey peaked, that was the title. Now the title is When Posey peaked at Christmas. Yeah, we had to change the title. So here are some drawings that the illustrator did for this book. And they're pretty nice too. We wrote our um, our comments on the on the pages here, and that my husband said that dead mice are creepy. He thought that looked creepy. There's another picture, but you see there are little notes that people have made, because it's not the final story yet. We're still making changes. I want to show you. Um, see if you can spot. Whoops lost you. There we are. See if we can spot the difference between this draft. This is when the book was almost ready, and that's the cover, and this is the final book. Can you see both of them? Or not? Go the right way. There we go. Okay, there's one pretty important difference. Besides that the color looks a little different. Anybody spot the difference? Go ahead. And um, under the words. Under the words? One of them is all yellow and the other one is not. Okay. This one, ha this one has different colors. Now the color looks quite a bit different when it was finally printed. You see anything else? There's something missing in, in this one, the early one. Does not have a cover? This one doesn't have a cover, true. But if you look closely at the picture, look at the mouse. See anything on the mouse? Want me to put it under the camera so you can see it better? Yeah. Okay, let me put it under the camera, because this was actually a pretty important difference, as it turned out. Okay? What do you see different be uh, in the mouse there, besides the color? She's, She's missing... Huh? Um, his tail? She doesn't have a ribbon in her hair. Ah, bingo. She doesn't have a ribbon in her hair. Now, why, why would that be important? It was actually really important, and the book almost got made without that ribbon, except that I happened to notice it at the last minute. The reason why that's important is because this is a story. I'll go back to the camera so you can see better. This is a story that starts out with a grandma mouse telling a story about when she was a little girl. And what does she have in her hair? She's got that flower. She's got the flower. So then she starts to tell the story about this little mouse named Posy. 
And the way we know it's Posey is that Posey always has the flower in her hair. There's Posey, because there are other mice in the story, but Posey's the only one with the flower. So that was really important for that. To, see, now we know that's Posey. She's got the flower. And then at the end of the story, we'll skip ahead to the end, that it's really important because as Grandma's telling her story, her grandchildren figure out that Posey was actually Grandma. And then we know, too, that Posey was Grandma because of that flower. So little details like that can be really important in the story. And if that flower hadn't been in there, it would have been, it would have not been very good. It would have been a bad thing for the story. I can show you another um, example of that. Does anybody know, I'm going to switch back to looking at you. There you are. Does anybody know what the inside of the book is called, this part? You might know what this part's called, I bet. Anybody know what that part's called? Spine. Spine, all right. But how about the inside? That's a tougher one. There's a word for it. Starts with the G. It's called the gutter. The gutter, G-U-T-T-E-R. The gutter. And there's a rule in bookmaking with picture books is that you don't want to put anything important in the gutter because it's really hard to see it. Have you ever had the experience of reading a book and and there's it's real tight down there in the gutter and you can't quite see something that you're trying to see or you can't read something that's in there? Well, that's why you don't want to put anything important in the gutter. Well, guess what? When, I'm going to go back to the camera, when I got the uh, proofs, proof sheets for Trick or Treat, this book here, Trick or Treat, I opened it up to this page, and this is the gutter, and guess what? There was a ghost in the gutter, and the ghost was the main character in the book, but it was in the gutter. So... I wrote to the editor, I, yeah, I wrote to the editor and said, boy, I think there's a problem here. The ghost is in the gutter. And they said, oh, no, the ghost is in the gutter. And it had to go back to the illustrator. The artist had to move the ghost out of the gutter. See that? The ghost used to be right here. And so he moved the ghost over so he wouldn't be in the gutter. Now, I think, if you would like, it might be time to read another story. Or would you like to ask questions? Story. Do you have any story? Story. 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 Okay. Okay. How about Big Enough Anna? Do you like dog stories? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll do Big Enough on it. And this is a true story. So some of the stories I've written are I make up, and some of the stories are true. And then some stories like Blueberry Shoe have a little bit of truth in them, that, but are mostly made up. Big Enough Anna, the little sled dog who braved the Arctic. And there's her paw print. And there is Anna. See if we can see. There we go. There's the picture. Anna was the smallest and youngest puppy in her litter, born in a winter deep with snow. Walls of white edged the path to the dog lot where the puppies snuggled against their mother. Anna's owner, a dog musher named Pam, checked frequently on the new arrivals. That first month, she visited the puppies often talking to them, petting them, and watching them play. 
Soon they wriggled with happiness to see Pam coming. One day, when the puppies were about four weeks old, Anne appeared over the edge of the doghouse. She wanted to go exploring, but her three-inch legs weren't nearly long enough to reach the ground. Plop! Anna scrambled headfirst into the snow. Rold and Sojo, her brother and sister, were not so brave. They waited several days before following Anna out into the big white world. At three months, Anna was the first to wear a dog harness. Pam attached a string tied to a twig for her to drag around. When the other puppies saw Anna, they wanted to practice being sled dogs too. Soon all three were pulling twigs, then sticks, then small logs. When they were five months old, the puppies tried mushing for the first time. Each week, Pam increased the distance they traveled. One mile, two miles, three. By six months, all the puppies could pull a sled for five miles. Little Anna always pulled the hardest. The puppies didn't know it, but Pam was preparing for a long and difficult expedition. Next winter, she hoped to become the first woman to mush alone across the Arctic. It would take about six months, she thought, to travel 2,500 miles by dog sled. Pam decided to let the puppies train with the older dogs. She watched them carefully to see if they were strong enough to join the expedition team. Anna was still the smallest dog in the lot, but she always tried hard and she paid attention. Anna just loved to run. One winter day, they met another team training on the trail. When the musher stopped to chat, Pam told him about her plan to mush dogs across the Arctic. Get rid of that one, he said, pointing to Anna. She's too little to pull much weight. Anna's tougher than she looks, Pam argued. She works hard and she never quits. That's more important than size. The man shook his head. She won't last a week, he muttered and mushed off. Don't listen to him, Pam told Anna. I think you're plenty big enough. Several months later, when the sun returned to the Arctic, Training ended and the expedition began. A crowd of well-wishers gathered to see them off. The puppies were 13 months old now. Each had earned a place on the team. They ran in the back, where all young sled dogs start out. Anna was still the smallest, but she worked the hardest. She always kept her tug line straight and she listened when Pam spoke. Anna ran so well that Pam did something she'd never done before. She let a puppy try running in the lead, the most important position. That's up here in the front. She moved on a right up front, right next to Dougie, a big, strong nine-year-old who had led many trips in the Arctic. Poor Dougie. Anna was excited to be up front, but she didn't know what to do. Dougie had to show her everything how to follow commands, how to find a trail, how to tell if ice was too thin for safe crossing. When Pam yelled, gee, Anna ran straight ahead until Dougie <laughs> to the right. It was hard work for Dougie. He was a patient teacher. It was hard work for Anna too, but she learned quickly. First G and Pa, then whoa, stop, let go to begin. About halfway through the expedition, a group of caribou trotted by just as Pam was harnessing up the dogs. For once, dependable Dougie disobeyed. Before Pam could stop him, Dougie ran after the caribou and disappeared into the hills. The next morning, Dougie still hadn't returned to camp. Pam grew worried. 
Was Dougie all right? Would they find him? Without a lead dog, the expedition could not continue. She studied Anna. Could such a small, young dog possibly take over as leader? What do you say, Pam asked, scratching behind Anna's ears. Are you big enough to lead this team on your own? For the next week and a half, with Anna in lead, they searched the hills and valleys for Dougie. Day after day, Anna led the team, mile after mile after mile. On the tenth day, Pam gave up hope of ever seeing Dougie again. Without food or water, he could not survive. Sadly, she decided it was time to quit searching. Still, there was hope for the expedition. Anna had done so well leading on her own, there was a chance they could still finish. As they packed up to leave, a snowmobiler came by. Someone had found Dougie. The dog seemed to understand. With Anna leading, they raced to meet Dougie. But when they reached him, the team realized something was wrong. Dougie was thin and exhausted. He didn't seem to recognize them, but simply stood still, his eyes listless and dazed. The team sniffed him gently. Cautiously, they wagged their tails. Dougie looked at his teammates as if waking from a bad dream. Slowly, very slowly, his tail started to wag as well. After several days of rest and plenty to eat, Dougie was able to travel again. But he couldn't leave for long without becoming tired. Now, big, strong Dougie needed little Anna to help him. Near the end of the expedition, they began crossing a frozen sea so wide that it would take about 10 days to reach the other side. The team made good time the first day. Then the weather turned unusually warm. The frozen sea beneath them began to melt. The dogs had to work extra hard to pull through several inches of slush. Each day it became harder to travel. Most days it rained. Soon the ice was dotted with holes hidden beneath the slush. If it melted much more, there would be no ice left to travel on. Then they would fall into the sea and drown. To make matters even worse, they were almost out of food. Pam had to cut meals in half before they ran out completely. Only Dougie received full portions. Even with full meals, Dougie wasn't strong enough to pull. Everyone was wet, exhausted, and hungry. Could they make it to the other side? got tired, but she didn't give up. She kept right on slogging through the slush. She guided the team around thin ice and jumped bravely over areas of open water. If Anna can keep going, I can too, thought Pam. The team seemed to agree. On and on they trudged, following Anna. Finally, on the 14th day, they saw land. Closer and closer, Anna picked out a path through the slush. Soon they were just a hundred feet, a hundred steps from shore. Suddenly, splash, Anna disappeared into a hole. The hole was filled with frigid seawater, churning like a whirlpool. Anna scrambled frantically to keep her head above water, her front paws thrashing at the ice as she struggled to pull herself out. Pam rushed forward to help. Crack! The ice beneath her began to break. If Pam fell in too, they both would die. She had to retreat to the sled. The water was so cold, Anna couldn't last much longer. <clears throat> Dougie was still weak, but he was their only hope. Pam yelled, Ha, Dougie, ha! Could he do it? Could he save Anna? Dougie understood. Somehow he found the strength to start pulling. 
Anna kept trying to claw her way onto the ice. Dougie pulled, but he was too weak to drag her out on his own. Suddenly, the other dogs jumped into action. They strained at the rope with Dougie. Slowly, inch by inch, they pulled Anna out of the sea. For a moment, Pam held her breath, wondering, is Anna too frightened to go on? But the moment passed. Anna shook herself off and stepped back into lead as if nothing had even happened. Pam shook her head in amazement. What a tough, brave little dog. Let's go, Pam called, and off they mushed. Soon they were standing on dry, solid land. Many miles later, they reached the end of their long journey. With Pam whooping and hollering on the back of the sled, little Anna led the team into town where the mayor and a crowd of people waited to congratulate them. Pam shook hands with everyone, saying, thank you, thank you. When the excitement died down, Pam sat quietly with her dogs. I'm so proud of you all, she said. What a great team. They wagged their tails, and she knew they understood. Pam turned to Anna. You're still small, she said, but you're a lead dog now. I can count on you to never give up. You're plenty big enough, Anna. And that's the end of the story. Um, on this page here, it shows there's a map of where she traveled, starting up in Barrow, all the way across Alaska, and then all the way across Canada. And here's where Dougie got lost. And here's where Anna fell through the ice. And here's where they reached the end of their journey, all the way over on the other side of Canada. And here's a couple, couple photographs from the trip. So that was a true story. And I think um, for closing, I'll show you one last um, set of thumbnail sketches. This is from the book Winter Is, and this is a different artist, a different illustrator, and she did her, her ske initial sketches, her dummy sketches, differently than the others, but um, they all serve the same purpose, and that became this book here, Winter Is. But uh, the book itself is now out of print, but in the amazing um, world of technology, it lives on as an iPad app. So now if I can do this right, we will go to, no, I need to go back. Okay, we'll go to the iPad. It should take just a few seconds here. Okay, now there's the iPad screen, and now I'm going to uh, touch on Winter Is down here. Winter Is and Dixon. So there it is. It's, now it's an iPad app. And I'll show you how it works. Oh, no, that was wrong. Go back. Winter is <laughs> and Dixon. Okay, I need to. Huh, for some reason. It... Okay, there Winter we go. is coming and I can't wait. Boy. If you touch the girl, some of the objects. Ice creaks and groans, freezing thick on the lake. How long will it be till the ice doesn't break? At last, we can skate and glide. Now winter is here, numbing noses and toes. On porch doors and windows, a frost garden grows. We melt the flowers with our breath. 
Winter is white, sparkling snow piles up high. We shovel a rooftop, now look at us fly. In fluffy snow pillows we land. Winter is black, spilling night into day. We watch northern lights start to flicker and sway. They swirl like bright, crazy dancers. Winter is cold, sending shivers down deep. In thick, furry coats, the wild animals sleep. Shh! Don't wake them, please. Winter is dark, making shadows all around. Our lantern beam leaps as we mush homeward bound. What a bouncing trail to follow. Winter is light, bringing holiday cheer. Through long, cozy nights, bulbs and candles shine clear. Our dreams fill with toys, treats, and treasures. Winter is bright. Stepping softly, we prowl. We're watching and listening for moose, fox, and owl. Moonbeams shimmer around us. Late winter is warm, melting hills in the sun. We throw off our coats for another sled run. Back down we swoosh and we slide. Winter is long, thawing snow drip, drip, drips. We step off the path and sink up to our hips. Laughing, we empty our boots. Now winter is gone, trailing patches of snow. Through thickets of willow, young moose say, hello. We call, but they run to their mother. At last the ice melts, landing ducks splash the lake. Our footsteps ooze mud, but in trees are awake. Look, the world is light, leafy green. Summer is coming and I can't wait. Winter is Anne Dixon. <laughs> okay, once is enough. All right. Can are we back to normal? Something is okay. Can, can you hear me? No? That's live. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, now we can. All right. Well, does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to ask about? Yes, the girl with her hand raised in gray. Yeah. Hey, let's tell it. Um, let's talk to you like what? I think so. The question because I couldn't hear it. Um, can, books, can books talk to you in words? Can books talk to you in words? Yeah. Well, some books can. If there are audio books, you know, books that have been recorded, or like that book that just read from an iPad. That was a talking book. So, yeah, some books can do that.
Did you know any of the illustrators, Anne? Um, I knew Yvonne okay. Zerbitz and I knew Mindy Dwyer. Um, the other illustrators I met later, later after they worked on the books. Well, most of them. I did. I never met the um, trick or treat. I never met him. And I never met the one for um, Posey and Posey Peaks. They live back east somewhere. Okay. Another thing I was I was going to show you um, <coughs> one of the books, Big Enough Anna, the dog book that we read. That was translated into some other languages, which is kind of fun. Here's one. Anybody know what language that is? I don't hear any guesses. You, you pick. Yes, it's you pick. Yeah. Very good. It was translated um, by the Lower Cuscoquim School District. And that's what it looks like. Same story. And then here's another one. Can you guess on that one? Close. Not quite. Japanese. Close. <laughs> Try one more. Korean. Yes. Korean. Yeah. So that's kind of fun to have a book translated. It looks a little different. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, do we, I'm not sure how long we're going with this. So. Do you want another story or? Another story? Yeah, we can do another story. I have more stories. We could do the sleeping lady. Or what else? I could tell you about a new story that I think is going to be a book. All right, I'll just make a decision here. Well, how about we read The Sleeping Lady? Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. You're up for that? Okay. This book is currently out of print, but it will be supposed to be coming back into print in the next um, six months or so. Sleeping Lady, now this is a special kind of story. It's a legend. So uh, sometimes people say, well, are legends really true? And you know, there's stories that have been told from one person to another, from generation to another, and uh, nobody really knows how they, how a legend began, but um, they have a power that lasts over time. And this is the first picture here. Once, long ago in Alaska, there lived a race of giant people along the shores of Cook Inlet. The land then was warm and covered with fruit trees of every kind. Woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers roamed the forests and beaches, but did not harm the gentle inlet people. Peace and happiness ruled the land. Especially happy were a young man named Nikatla and a young woman named Susitna. 
for they were in love and soon to be married. As the wedding day neared, the inlet people gathered eagerly for the celebration. But the day before the wedding, a stranger burst into the village. Danger, he cried. Warriors from the north are coming. They roam from village to village, killing people, stealing from them, and burning their homes. Stranger, how do you know this? Someone asked. The man's face clouded with pain. They have destroyed my village, my family, everything, he answered. Only I escaped. Beware, these people are cruel and crazed for blood. All plans for the wedding were forgotten. <coughs> the villagers gathered in council. First one person spoke, then another. Some thought they should quickly fashion weapons and attack the warriors. Others thought they should prepare to fight the warriors when they came to the village. Still others wanted to hide in the forest until the warriors passed them by. Nakatla and Susitna listened in silence, their hearts deeply troubled. After everyone had spoken, Nakatla rose. I too have an idea, he began, but I do not know if there are people here brave enough to go with me. I say this, I will not fight these people, and neither should you. We have few weapons, for we gave up the ways of war long ago. We've learned a better way, which is peace. But I will not run away from this danger, for then the warriors will kill many more. This is my proposal. We'll travel north to meet them. We'll convince them to lay down their weapons and live in peace. We'll carry gifts rather than weapons, so they'll have no reason to attack us. And I am willing to go first. It was a bold plan, but the people agreed to it. All the men of the village would go. Immediately, everyone began preparing for the dangerous journey north. By morning, the men were ready to leave. Sadly, Susitna and Nakatla said goodbye on a hill above the village where they had spent many hours together. We'll be married as soon as I return, promised Nakatla. I'll wait for you at this very spot, answered Susitna. And Susitna watched thoughtfully, hopefully, until the men disappeared into the forested mountains. Susitna made ready to wait. She ran back to the village for her needles, knife, and baskets, then busied herself gathering nuts and berries. On the second day, she tired of gathering fruit, so she cut roots and grasses to weave into baskets. This amused her for many hours, but eventually she tired of making baskets, too. Susitna spent the third day sewing, for she was too weary to gather fruit and cut grasses. Yet she could not sleep, wondering if the men had succeeded in their mission. Perhaps Nakatla would return at any moment. But many days and nights went by, each more slowly than the last. Finally, Susitna could no longer pick berries, weave baskets, or even sew. I will lie down just for a moment, she said, and she fell fast asleep. While Susitna slept, word of a terrible battle reached her village. Nakatla was brave, reported a boy who had escaped. He led our men to meet with the warriors. But as he and their leader were about to speak, someone threw a spear. Their men set upon ours, and we fought until all our men were dead or dying, and many of theirs too. The women and children wept to hear the names of the fathers, sons, and brothers they had lost. When the women went to tell Susitna the terrible news, they couldn't bear to wake her from such peaceful sleep. Let her rest, they decided. Why break her heart any sooner than we must? 
and they wove a blanket of soft grasses and wildflower blossoms, which they gently laid over her. May Susitna always dream of her lover, they prayed. That night, all warmth and joy left the village. As the air grew colder and colder, Susitna settled more deeply into sleep. All around her, the fruit trees froze and died, falling like the men in battle. The tears of the villagers gathered into clouds and in the chill air returned to earth as Alaska's first snowfall. The snow fell slowly at first, one flake at a time, but soon it filled the sky, spreading thickly across the entire land. For seven days and nights the snow fell, until Susitna and all her people lay beneath a blanket of shimmering white. Days passed into years, and years into hundreds and thousands of years. For a few months each summer, warmth returned to the land allowing birch trees and spruce and willow to grow. Grizzly bears, moose, and other new animals appeared, taking the place of the old. After a long time, a new race of humans, smaller than the first, came to stay. Today, Susitna still sleeps through the seasons, dreaming of Nakatla. If you look across Cook Inlet in the winter, you can see her covered by a snowy quilt. In summer, you see her resting beneath a green and flowered blanket. It is said that when the people of war change their ways and peace rules the earth, Nakatla will return. Then Susitna, the sleeping lady, will awake. And that's the end of the story. And Susitna is actually a real mountain. Did you know that? If you go to Anchorage and look across the water, across Cook Inlet, you can see Mount Susitna. And that's the legend of Mount Susitna. Well, thank you for being good listeners. Um, I think that I have about read all the stories I can at one sitting. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.